A Retreating Tide by R. A. Whitworth Prologue Ariana stood facing the circle-shaped moon hanging low over the shimmering sea. Stones, like great pillars, stood tall on either side of her, flowing towards a great circle of stones, each standing like ghostly shapes in the darkness. The power the moon gave was not enough. She knew it, as she had known all along. But there was no alternative. Too many had already fallen. The many faces of the dead son before her, of those she had loved, and of many who were forevermore remain nameless. Her hands were dirty with the blood of those she had led to their deaths, trying to escape the wrath of the shadows. Their bodies bloody and cold, lying in the darkness unburied where they had fallen. Enough was enough. It was time to end it. The mirror in her hand glowed white, hot and golden, her solemn face shining through it like a picture. The answer was clear. It would not last, but she knew what she must do. She would not live to see the sun rise. The whispers had told her so. She stepped forward. Every part of her body cried out in protest. The swirling force of energy and light pushed her back. Now is not the time! She ignored the energy's cry. Someone else would have to finish her work after she was gone. The foundations were laid. It was too late to turn back now, as she forced her way through the thick wall of energy before her. There was a shout behind her, but she already felt apart from the living. As soon as she passed over the threshold into the stone circle, energy surfed through her very being. Her arms outstretched. Suddenly she was bursting with light. And then her feet left the ground. The mirror, already blinding in the light it emitted, left her grasp to float with her, golden, like sunlight, like her long flowing curls of hair. She slowly turned in mid-air to gaze down upon the face of whoever had called out to her. Please, there has to be another way. There is, Ariana answered, her voice magnified. It's over to you now. Do what you can. She looked to the sky as the ball of light consumed her. The shadows had gathered high in the sky and formed a molten pulp. It dripped, formed a river that oozed before her. It flowed towards the mirror, and in a flash of light it was gone. Ariana's body hit the ground with a soft thud. Chapter 1 Know Them, Aurora Wolfric Stanza struggled to the top of the muddy hill. The path was long and steep. It had never been an easy one even less so after the recent storm. His long, knotted mass-brown hair was tied back loosely with a length of bootstring, and blew in the wind as he walked. For his age he was tall and strong. Growing up on his father's farm had made him so. He wore not overalls, but jeans, and a mud-splattered coat that might have once been his father's. It was still raining, but the worst of the rain was over. Until dawn that morning, lightning had flashed across the sky, Thunder had rumbled and the wind had howled, but only for a moment it had fallen silent. A silence broken only by the gentle bleating of the ewes with their lambs in the surrounding fields. Walthric could barely see them through the gentle mist. Atop the hill stood his father looking over his lands toward the sea, resembling an iron grey bar a few fields away. Walthric remembered that this land may one day be his. His father was near middle-aged, as he often put it. His back was slightly bent from years of looking after his land and after his many ewes. His once thick dark hair reduced to thin wisps of silvery grey. He turned when he heard Walthrick behind him. Hello, son, he said. How is she? Walthrick took a moment to recover his breath and answered, She's fine, but the midwife says she needs to be left alone for a little while. His father looked worried and Walthrick noticed that his father's face had changed over the few weeks before to become more strained and lined. What's happened, Walthrick? It was stillborn, Walthrick answered, trying to keep his face impassive. His father's face fell like a stone in water. He looked to the ground, saddened by the news. I was foolish to think that this could have worked. We're both too old to have another child. Walthrick was shocked to see his father fighting wet tears, and remembered how his father had raced out of the house that morning, as soon as the midwife had arrived. 
sad, but at least she doesn't have me. Orthrick said, slapping her hand to his father's shoulder. It just wasn't meant to be. His father looked back up from the ground, eyes still glistening. You're right. He wiped his eyes with his sleeve. It just wasn't meant to be. But we still have you, eh? That's what matters. He looked away from Orthric again, back towards the sea, and he stared for a long moment, deep in thought. Orthric joined him by his side, and his father spoke again. That storm was bad last night. I just hope those sheep haven't gotten into trouble on the shore. Apart from the herds that they kept in land, they also managed a herd that roamed the beaches and rocks. The meat was saltier than the rest and popular, selling well in the village market. They grazed on the dunes and on the beach where they ate seaweed and kelp washed upon the shore. But they were cost of this. Living close to the sea, the sheep were more exposed than the other herds, and in consequence, lambs and even ewes often got trapped in rocky gullies or stuck on cliff sides. Come on, we'd better have a look. Without another word, his saddle hurried down the hill, and Walthrick followed. The path was just as slippery as before, but his father, still preoccupied by the news Walthrick had given him, seemed untroubled by this, and walked as if the path was set in concrete. At the bottom of the hill was a battered stile. It had always been so, but now a chunk of wood was missing from one of the posts, leaving behind the formidable-looking splinters, a sign of how powerful the storm had been in the night. He heard his father grumble as he shifted the remains of the post aside and lay it to one side, slightly beneath the hedge and bordered the next field. This will be expensive to replace, Walthrick heard him say as he assessed the damage before continuing on with a heavy sigh. The next star they came across was in a similar state. It led from the narrow path between the fields and over a road toward the pebble beach. The next star they came across was in a similar state. It led from the narrow path between the fields and over a road toward the pebble beach. He helped his father move the wooden post that had fallen across the road and laid it again beneath the hedge. The wood's all rotted. Look! His father pointed in annoyance at the soft wood. Well, it has been there a few years, Walthrick countered. His father grunted in reply and crossed the road without needing to check. The road being so isolated anyway that cars seldom passed. Through the mist, he could hear the soft lapping of the waves sucking at the pebbles. There was a large bush on the fringe of the beach. Its leaves had been whitened by the sea spray and looked almost skeletal. He looked around, but there wasn't a ewe nor lamb in sight. Right, it looks as if we're going to have to do some searching, his father said after casting his own eyes across the scene and adopting an authoritative manner. I'll search the part of the beach to the left and you search to the right past the cliffs. Walthrick nodded. I'll see you in a bit then, he said, and strode down toward the beach, wondering if his father had suggested us to be alone, or so that he could get home sooner. There was a rough slope of pebbles, and as he walked down them all too confidently, he stumbled as they suddenly shifted underfoot, cackling as they fell. He regained his balance and cursed quietly so his father wouldn't hear, but when he looked back, he saw that his father had gone. He walked on at the beach in the direction his father had indicated. He hadn't been walking long when he came across a muddy brown ewe chewing upon a large front of kelp, its jaw moving rhythmically side to side, which looked up as he approached. The front dropped from its mouth and it bleated loudly at him. A small blackish lamb came bounding up to it and hid between the legs of its mother. It stared back at him with its big black eyes. The scene made him smile for a moment in amusement, and he continued to walk onwards. The ewe moved out of his way as he approached, heading towards the rising cliffs with her lamb in close pursuit. The tide inched its way up towards the cliff face, retreating feebly at his attempt. Large black rocks rose above the pebbles. Some were jagged and pointed towards the sky like spikes, while others were flattened, big enough for someone to sit upon. 
Finally, he saw a crowd of ewes in the distance. They were grouped tightly together, and he wondered what had drawn them there, so far up the beach, away from their usual grazing areas. The pebbles gave way to sand beyond large rocks. As he approached, the ewes, along with their lambs, dispersed. He began to count them, but after fourteen something made him stop. There was a mound on the shoreline, and it wasn't a rock. His heart sank. Surely not, he said aloud. Not a dead ewe. The sheep bleated loudly and indignantly as he quickened his pace toward them. As he drew closer, he saw that it wasn't the body of a ewe, nor was it flotsam thrown up from the sea either, but the body of a young woman. She was lying with the side of her head upon her left arm, facing away from him. She wore a pure white gown of what looked like satin, and her legs were half submerged by the retreating tide. He bent over her body, and turned her onto her back. Water droplets glistened in the tight ringlets of her hair. She looked to be the same age as him, and her face was pale, almost as white as her gown. He shook her gently. There was no movement. He felt her pulse on her neck, and found it steady and slow. She was still alive. He felt himself relax a little as a cold wind blew harshly, somehow seeping through his coat and chilling him in an instant. He had to move her from the water. Some lambs had come over to investigate. A few walked tentatively towards them, frightened off as he straightened up. He hooked his arms into hers and began to pull her away from the water. She was thin, but in her dead weight she was heavy. He heaved hard, pulling her up the beach toward the cliffs where the sand was a little drier. When he lay her back down, he noticed something glowing on her chest. He knelt beside her. It was a necklace. Attached to the minute silver chain was a small circular moon that glowed brightly in like an opal in the light. He picked it up. It was ice cold, almost too painful to hold as he examined it, mystified. Suddenly... As if reacting to him touching her pendant, she woke. Her eyes flickered and she groaned loudly. It took her a few seconds to notice him, but when she did she let out a loud gasp and wriggled away from him, her chest heaving in fright. Don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you, he said, amused by her reaction. I'm Wolfric. He had out a hand. She stared at it for a few seconds before taking it feebly, and he shook her hand. I... Her voice cracked slightly. I'm Alicia. Alicia Parson. Walthwick smiled again and stood up slowly. He looked back out to the iron grey sea and wondered for the first time where she had come from. Were there any others? Did you fall from your boat? She didn't answer immediately, but thought for a long moment. No, she said finally. It wasn't a boat. Then why did you come from then? He asked, surprised. I... Her voice cracked. I don't know. I can't remember anything. She answered quietly and began to shiver. She crossed her arms. I'd better walk you back to my house before you catch a cold, he told her and noticing how thin her gown was, he took off his coat. Here, wear this. It will smell a bit of sheep, though. She took it gratefully, and slipped one thin arm into the sleeves at a time. She tried to get to her feet and fell, though he caught her. He was glad that he had given her his coat, as he thought that if she hadn't have been wearing it, she might have slipped through his arms. Here, put your arm around me, and I'll help you to walk. She did so, weakly, her strength fading. Walking back up the beach took on Walking back up the beach took much longer than before. She was much lighter now as she was conscious, but it was still a struggle for both of them. Her failing strength made things all the more difficult. When he was almost at the spot that he had seen the first year with her lamb, he saw the figure of his father running towards them in the distance. Alicia's head was bowed low, and Wolfric worried that she was about to lose consciousness again as his father supported her. "'Who's this?' he 
he asked. Her name is Alicia Parson, he breathed heavily. I found her washed upon the shore. That's why the sheep was so hard to find. They were all gathered around her near the rocks at the far end. Ah, I wondered why I didn't find any, his father replied in a low grunt. They soon reached the part where the pebbles formed the slope off the beach, and they heaved hard to get her over. They followed the road left to avoid the path over the hill, and when they got to the front gate of the small farmhouse, Walthrick saw the battered red car outside, indicating the midwife was still at the house. She must have seen them. She must have seen them through the living room window, struggling up the garden path, because she soon appeared at the door. What's happened? What's happened? She cried out, holding the door open for them to pass. Alicia was still bordering on unconsciousness when they laid her down onto the battered green sofa. Lothric heard the tap running in the kitchen, then the midwife pushed past him with a glass of water, which she held up to Alicia's lips. What's happened to you? The midwife asked her softly. The midwife asked her softly, putting down the half-empty glass on the coffee table beside her, as she sat on the edge of the armchair opposite them, where his father usually sat. Alicia took her time answering this question, as she had done with Walthrick earlier. I really don't know. All I remember is waking up and seeing Walthrick over me at the beach earlier. I can't remember how I got there, or anything else. They sat for a moment in silence, taking in what she had just said. Alicia found enough strength to sit up slightly, and the midwife handed her the glass. She finished it, and the midwife left to refill her glass. When she returned, Alicia drank deeply as if parched, possibly because of the seawater. She saw him watching her, and he looked quickly away to the window by the door. The sky was darkening, and he could see the silver moon, shining like a coin above a line of trees on the hill in the distance, and remembered something. He accepted a mug of tea from his father, and drank deeply, just as Alicia had feeling a rush of sudden warmth and energy through him. He looked back at Alicia and saw that her moon necklace had disappeared. Why did your... he began to say, but he was interrupted. It's getting dark outside. I think you'd better help her into the guest bedroom, Walthrick. She looks as if she needs a good rest after what she's been through. His mother appeared at the door to the hallway. She had been upstairs, and her face was red, and her eyes puffy from her grief at losing her child. His father was close behind her, and Walthrick knew that he must have told her what had happened. He left his empty mug on the coffee table and stood up to help Alicia to the guest room upstairs. He carried her alone, the stairs too steep and narrow to allow for more, but his father followed them from behind, and he heard his mother call. She can have one of my old nighties. Alicia made no comment. The guest bedroom had been what the baby would have moved into when it was older, if it had survived. Walthrick saw the dark wooden cot at the foot of his parents' bed when he had passed their bedroom. The walls of the guest bedroom were painted bright yellow with patterns of small flowers stenciled onto them, while the bed, which she remembered was second-hand, also had yellow covers and was tucked into the corner at the far end of the room. He left Alicia on the bed and fetched one of his mother's old nighties handing it to her through the door. As he wished her good night, he thought he heard her soft voice say, 